All right, let's jump into fluid resuscitation and burn patients. Okay, sounds good. It's different, right? Yeah. Than, say, fluid resuscitation in other trauma situations. Yeah, that's right. So burn injuries, um, they cause this continuous loss of fluid and protein, too. Mm. And this happens, well, it's from the blood vessels going right into the tissues. And this is because of inflammation. Inflammation increases capillary permeability. Okay. And, uh, you know, when you compare this to other kinds of trauma, like if you're thinking about bleeding, mm -hmm. that's where most of the fluid loss comes from. But for burn resuscitation, what we're really focusing on is uh, replacing the fluid that's lost because of that inflammatory response. Yeah. Got it. So if we have a patient who comes in with severe burns, what are those really critical immediate steps that we need to take? What needs to happen first? Well, the very first thing always is to make sure that airway is secure. Of course. Yeah. And could address any immediate life-threatening injuries. Yeah. Right. And then we need to get those IV lines in. Two large bore IVs. We're yeah. talking at least 18 gauge at minimum. And we want to use peripheral veins if we can. Upper extremities are best if they're not burned. So what happens if, um, you know, if a patient comes in and there really isn't any unburned skin available for placing those IVs? Well, if there's just no unburned skin to be found, we can go ahead and place those IVs right through the burn skin. And, um, you know, if we just can't get peripheral access, then we've got to consider central venous access or even intraosseous infusion as another option. All right. So once we have that access, what's the uh, what's the preferred fluid to start with? So the go to for that initial fluid resuscitation is a warmed isotonic crystalloid solution. OK. And uh, lactated ringer solution is generally our ideal choice there. Yeah. But. You know, got to be careful because we can get some pretty significant edema and that can actually dislodge those peripheral IV lines, especially for dealing with larger burns. So uh, in those cases, it's a good idea to consider using some longer catheters. OK, that makes sense. So now we're thinking about monitoring our patient's fluid status. And I know that blood pressure, that can be a little bit tricky in these patients. Is that right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Blood pressure can be really unreliable when you've got a patient with severe burns. And, um, you know, this is because of the edema and just that circumferential nature of the burns themselves. So really what we rely on is the best indicator of whether our fluid resuscitation is working is urine output. Urine output. Yeah, we need to get that indwelling urinary catheter in and monitor that closely. And what is the target urine output that we're shooting for in adults? So for adults, our target urine output is 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Okay. Or if you're thinking in cubic centimeters, that's going to be 30 to 50 cc's per hour. All right. But, you know, just something to keep in mind, you got to be careful about uh, osmotic diuresis. If a patient has high blood sugar or they're getting mannitol, that can throw things off. It can actually make that urine output look higher than it really is. Mm -hmm. Good point. So let's talk about those guidelines for fluid resuscitation, specifically in adults who have those um major second or third degree burns. Right. So the current guidelines from the American Burn Association, they recommend two milliliters of lactated ringers solution, and that's per kilogram of body weight. And then you multiply that by the percentage of total body surface area that's burned. Okay. So two milliliters per kilogram times the percentage of total body surface area. And now when we're dealing with electrical injuries, are those guidelines different? Yeah, they are. So for electrical injuries, we increase that fluid rate we go to four milliliters of lactated ringer solution per kilogram per percentage of total body surface area burned. And uh, with electrical injuries, we're continuing that fluid resuscitation until the urine clears. Okay. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's important to remember, these newer guidelines, they came about because there were some concerns about over-resuscitation with the older Parkland formula. That used four milliliters per kilogram per percentage of total body surface area across the board. Right. And, um, Generally speaking, when we're looking at burns that are greater than 20% of total body surface area, that's when we need to really be thinking about burn resuscitation fluids. All right. So when we've calculated that total fluid volume that a patient needs for that first 24 hours, how do we actually administer that? So the way we do it is we give half of that total calculated fluid volume during those first eight hours. Okay. And we start that from the time of the burn injury. And then for that remaining half of the fluid, we give that over the next... 16 hours. Okay. And we slow that rate down a bit for that second period. Can you give me an example just to make sure that I'm understanding that calculation correctly? Sure, yeah. So let's say we have a 100 kilogram person and they have 80% total body surface area burns. Okay. So our calculation is going to be 2 milliliters times 80 times 100. 
and that gives us 16,000 milliliters total in that 24-hour period. All right. So that means we're going to give 8,000 milliliters in those first eight hours, and that works out to a rate of 1,000 milliliters per hour. Okay, got it. So after those initial eight hours, do we just automatically cut that IV fluid rate in half? Or how do we determine that? No, we don't just automatically cut it in half. We have to be really careful about that. What we do is we adjust that rate based on the patient's urine output. Okay. So remember, our goal is to keep that urine output at 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for adults. Yeah. And um, unless the patient is hypotensive, we generally want to avoid giving fluid boluses. If we're seeing low urine output, then we need to carefully adjust that continuous infusion rate to try and bring it up. All right. Now, all of this has been about adult patients. So how do these fluid resuscitation guidelines change when we're taking care of pediatric patients? Yeah. So pediatric fluid resuscitation, it does have some key differences. Yeah. The first is that we start with a higher initial fluid volume. We're going with three milliliters per kilogram per percentage of total body surface area burned. Okay. And then um, for children who are under 30 kilograms, we need to make sure we're also giving them maintenance fluids. And for that, we'll use D5LR, which is 5% dextrose and lactated Ringer solution. And that's on top of their burn resuscitation fluids. And the reason we do that is to prevent them from developing low blood sugar, hypoglycemia. All right. And so what about that target urine output for kids? For children under 14 years old, our target urine output is higher. We're aiming for one milliliter per kilogram per hour. Okay. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the specifics of those fluid rates, but what happens if we don't get it right? What are the dangers of under-resuscitating a patient or over-resuscitating them? Yeah, so if we under-resuscitate a patient, that's a real problem. We're risking hypoperfusion, and that can lead to end-organ injury. Okay. On the flip side, if we over-resuscitate, we're going to see that edema increase, mm -hmm. and that can actually worsen the depth of the burn. It can also lead to compartment syndrome. Oh, wow. And compartment syndrome can happen in the abdomen or the extremities. So it's it's really about finding that balance, making sure that we're giving enough fluid to maintain adequate perfusion. And that's where that urine output monitoring comes in. All right. Now, you know, when I was doing a little reading about burn patients, I seem to remember something about heart rhythm problems. Is that something that we need to be worried about? Yeah. So cardiac dysrhythmias, they can definitely pop up in burn patients. And um, they can actually be an early sign that something else is going on. They might be a sign of hypoxia or they could be a sign of electrolyte or acid-base imbalances. Okay. So we need to be monitoring that heart rhythm continuously, and electrocardiography, or EKG, is how we're going to do that. All right, so just to recap, can we go over those fluid rates one last time? So for flame or scald burns in adults and in older children, those 14 years old and up. All right, so for flame or scald burns in adults and children who are 14 years and older, we're using 2 milliliters of lactated ringer solution per kilogram per percentage of total body surface area burned. And we want to see that urine output at 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour, or if you prefer, 30 to 50 milliliters per hour. Okay, and now for younger children under 14 years old. So for flame or scald burns in children under 14 years, we're going to use 3 milliliters of lactated ringer solution per kilogram per percentage of total body surface area burned. And in this case, our target urine output is 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour. All right. And what about those really little ones, infants and young children? Right. So for flame or scald burns in infants and young children, and specifically we're talking about those who weigh 30 kilograms or less, we're still using that 3 milliliters of lactated ringer solution per kilogram per percentage of total body surface area burned. But we're also going to add in a sugar-containing solution, and we give that at the maintenance rate. And our target urine output for these little guys, it's also 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour. And finally, for electrical injuries, regardless of age. Right. So for electrical injuries across all ages, we're using four milliliters of lactated ringer solution per kilogram per percentage of total body surface area burned. And we're running that until the urine clears. And our target urine output, it's a little higher in this case, one to 1.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour until that urine clears. All right. So it seems like evaluating the circulating blood volume in these patients who have severe burns, that can be pretty difficult. Is that right? It can be, yeah. yeah, especially if they have other injuries on top of the burns. You know, sometimes it's just really hard to get a clear picture. But the bottom line is, if a patient's in shock, we have to treat that shock. And our goal with that treatment is to maintain perfusion to those vital organs. Makes sense. Well, I think that about covers it for fluid resuscitation and burn patients. Yeah, I think we hit the high points. Thanks for breaking it all down. Really appreciate your expertise. My pleasure. Until next time. See you then.
Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.